Lord. Amen. 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 Very, very warm greetings. Uh, we thank God for the opportunity to fellowship here. This is my first time in this ministry and I thank God for the opportunity to come fellowship here. And I want thank you for inviting me. Hallelujah. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me to come share fellowship and uh, share my ministry in this place. God bless you, sir. Please can we clap our hands for the servant of God. We honor you, sir. We thank you for all that you are doing for the Lord in this place. Amen. Amen. You know, in my opinion, um, the, the pastor's work is one of the most challenging and most uh, demanding profession on the planet. It's the truth. If you don't know, you don't know. Um, and we thank God for the pastor. But I think that the work and the ministry of the pastor's wife is even much harder than the pastor. That's right. Hallelujah. You can see, the pastor who preaches, you know, people celebrate him. But the truth is this, that if the wife he has at home does not allow him to function, he cannot function. That's right. I've been married now 22 years. Woo. I understand it. If, if the woman decides he will not function, he will not function. So we celebrate you, Mama. Amen. Clap your hands for us. For all the sacrifices that you make, that most people don't see. For all the things that you deny yourself to make sure the vision goes off. I haven't met you before, but I know. I understand this terrain very well. God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you. For all the tears that you weep in the secret place. For the vision, for the assignment, for the people of God under your care, they don't even have any idea. God bless you. We honor you. Please clap your hands and celebrate. <laughs> I salute all the men of God in the house, all my brothers and fellow laborers in the work of the Lord. We honor all of you. Thank you for being here today. It's such an encouragement to see everyone come out to support and to be part of what God is doing here tonight. God bless you, sir. Bishop, God bless you. I speak here. What God has started in the mighty name of Jesus. He has perfected it in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. All right, let's get into God's word. I was asking uh, Pastor Ike, how long do I have? He didn't tell me. So if you are late, yes. <laughs> I I I literally can keep us here till twelve minutes, but I won't do that. Don't worry. <laughs> but praise God, Amen. Amen. All right, I want to get into. Um, my discourse for tonight. I will start tonight and I will finish tomorrow. Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm going to try and manage my time and try and see how much I can deliver tonight and then I will finish off tomorrow. Amen. Amen. God has called me as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to teach God's word. So I'm going to teach tonight. Amen. Amen. The purpose of teaching is for establishment. That's right. Amen. It's for what? When Jesus was ministering on the parable of the sower, you remember that story? He talked about types of soil and he mentioned that, thank you so much, the first type of soil is the wayside. And he, when he was giving interpretation of the parable, he said, these are the people who received the word, but did not understand it. 
But what? Did not understand. They did not understand it. And then the Bible says the birds of the air came and picked up the seeds. And Jesus interpreted it to say that those birds were demons. There were demons that came to pick up the word that the people didn't understand. And they, they took it, they ate the word. And the word did not produce in the hearts of the people. Right. Now, when a teaching gift is in operation, what the anointing that is on the teaching gift is to bring understanding. The moment understanding comes, those birds cannot function. So, in other words, a teaching anointing stops the devil right there. So that if people understand the truth, we automatically have dislodged the demons that will come to pick up the ones. So demons hate the teaching gift. They don't like it. Because when people understand truth, the Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth will what? It will make you free. The word actually is make in, in the original language. It's a process. It makes you free. So when you are free, you are free. Hallelujah. Amen. Liberty is what Jesus came to give to us. Amen. So when you are free, you are free. And if you are free, you are no longer under constraints. Amen. And there is nothing the enemy can do to hold back somebody who is free. You know, many times people think, oh, there's an anointing here. Many times people think that the devil is that powerful. He's not. No, he's not. No, no, he's not. Understanding dislodges him. When someone is taught and is well grounded in the truth, you render the devil useless. So the devil has power to the extent of your ignorance. The Bible says my people perish for what? For lack of knowledge, not for because the devil is bad. It's just the lack of knowledge. Meaning that when people have knowledge and have understanding and establish, Satan will not be able to operate. So you actually stop him right there when you want to understand something. Listen, the Bible says that he walks around like what? A roaring lion, first Peter chapter 5, seeking whom to devour. Meaning that he cannot devour everybody. No, no, it's everybody is not open to the child. Nah. He is looking. So he has a criteria that he uses to check who can be devoured and who cannot be devoured. So he looks, this one can be devoured, this one cannot be devoured. Today God is moving you from, from the place where you are vulnerable to the place where you cannot be devoured. Hallelujah. If he was that powerful, he wouldn't have needed to seek permission to touch Job. So tonight, God is going to help us Amen. with some stuff. Amen. Amen. The theme of this conference is divine speed. Divine speed. So I want to start from there. And uh, like I said, I'm just going to go. Wherever my time stops, I will stop there and then tomorrow I'll continue. Is that good? Yes. All right. Speed is an expression of dominion. To be able to move speedily is an expression of dominion. Write that down. It's a manifestation and expression of dominion. Let me explain something to us. What is dominion? Dominion is to have life at your own terms. Dominion means what? To have life at your own terms. That's what it means to have dominion. So to think it, to say it, and to have it as you thought it is dominion. Mm. Write that down. To think it and say it and then have a manifestation of what you said according to what you thought. That's what dominion is. So a man or a woman who is in dominion has manifestation as they think it. Amen. That's what dominion is. If you think about that definition, apply it. 
So you don't want something. You don't want something. You think it, you say it, and it manifests the way you said it. So I don't want this yet. Or I don't want this experience. Or I don't want this. I don't want that. The moment you think it and say it and it manifests, that's the reason. Or I want this. I want it. So you think it, you say it, you have it. That's the meaning. Now when you think it and say it and I have it, as soon as you say it, that's speed. So when you can control the process of manifestation, that's real dominion. Amen. Amen. And is it possible to understand the protocol for controlling manifestation? It is. And I want to teach on it today and then I'll finish tomorrow. Are we good? Are we good? Yes. Are you still talking with me? Yes. Alright, so let's go from the beginning. I always like to start from the beginning so that I lay a foundation we understand it. When God put Adam in the garden from the beginning, God said, let them have dominion. And Adam had dominion before the fall. He had dominion. So meaning that, according to this definition I gave you, when he thinks something, he says, and he has what he said. See, the Garden of Eden was, is not like a garden like you see today. That place was fluid. So, so things moved according to how Adam wanted it. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Things operated according to how he wanted it. The Bible says he had dominion over the beds of the air. Yeah? He had a dominion over the animals that creeped on the ground. You can't have dominion over <coughs> birds if you cannot do what they do. Yes. He had dominion over the ones that were in the sea. So meaning that Adam could move in the water. He could also move in the air. He could also move in the land. Everything was subject to him. He had no limitations. So whatever he thought, his body could do what he thought. That's how he had dominion in the garden. So whatever he Thought his body could do whatever he thought. In other words, his body followed his mind. Wow. Come on, sir. His body followed his mind. So, so when he thought it, his remember that when they put him in the garden, the Bible said that he was made a living soul. So he was a soul who had life. And remember that the soul is the body, is the is the will, the mind, and the emotions. So he was a living soul. So, so Adam, what we see now as man was not the way Adam was before the fall. Alright. So Adam had speed in the garden. And when the enemy saw what was happening in the garden, the Bible says that God showed up daily. In the cool of the day, God came. Now, Bible scholars debate when the cool of the day is. It doesn't matter. Some people say it was early in the morning. Some people say it was in the evening. It doesn't matter. It was a time when the sun was not hot. Whether it was early in the morning or later in the evening, it doesn't matter. He came at the cool of the day to fellowship with Adam and his wife. And that time was a time when he talked with them and communed with them. And that process was to show Adam who he really was. God was revealing Adam to Adam. Hello. Are you here? Yes. Because Adam was the image of God. So the only way for Adam to know who he really was 
was to spend time with the object because it was an image. So for him to understand himself, he needed to know God. And that was why God came every day to fellowship with him so that Adam could know God and by knowing God, know himself. So Adam was in the process of unfolding. He was coming to know himself and understand himself better as God spent time with him. Can I suggest to you that it's still the same thing that is happening today. When you spend time with God, you get to know you. So when I hear people say, I, 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 I want to know myself. I said, the only way to know yourself is to know God. If you don't know God, you can't know you. So, so communion with God unfolds you. Oh, yeah. Fellowship with God does what? Unfolds you. The deeper you know God, the more you unfold. So the more you get to know who you are, what you are supposed to be, and what you're supposed to be doing. So the deeper you know God, the more you know yourself. So if you really want to know yourself, you start by getting to know God. Right. So this was what was going on in the garden. Every day God came and spoke to them. Remember that God's word and, him, and himself are the same. Amen? Amen. So when he spoke to them, he imparted himself to Adam. And as Adam received an impartation of God, Adam unfolded and Adam got to know himself better. Mm -hmm. So Adam was going somewhere. It was a process. Because when God said, let us make man, that make there is a process. Yes, so the process started. The enemy saw where it was going. And the enemy decided to stop the process. But he knew that the only way to stop the process was to infect Adam. So he plotted it. And he went after Adam. He went after Adam through his wife. That's a, that's a message for another day. But he came through his wife. And when he came there, he, he said to her a few things that confused her. The Bible said that she was deceived. It was, it was a strategy the enemy adopted to mess the woman up. So she got confused and she was deceived. And basically what the enemy did was to sow doubt in their heart about the goodness of God. Please hear me. It was to sow doubt about the goodness of God. Basically, he began to cause them to doubt the character of God. Basically, he suggested to them that God is not good. God has ulterior motives and he is not as good as he's projecting himself to be. There are some things that are good for you, but he doesn't want you to have it. That's true. Think about it. That's true. If you say you are my friend, and you say you love me, and I find out that there are some things that were made for my good, but you kept it away from me, what does that say to me about the friendship? See, see, that's what the enemy did. He sowed that seed. And it was a lie. He lied to them. Hello? He lied to them that God had ulterior motives. And he was not as straightforward as he projected himself to be. He was keeping something away from them. God is not a good God. And this was the painful part. They believed it. They bought that lie. When they bought that lie, the, the woman even, you know, when she, she believed it, how do I know she believed it? Because she ate the fruit. She ate the fruit first. Because she believed what the enemy said. So, so immediately she ate the fruit. Then she gave her husband to eat. When that fruit entered Adam's hand, Adam understood what was going on. 
The woman was deceived, but Adam was not. Adam understood what was going on. So Adam had a choice to make. Choose God. And go with God. Or choose his wife and go against God. If he ate the fruit, he had chosen his wife over God. And remember that he had known God longer than he knew the wife. If he chose God, he would have to deal with whatever mess this woman is inside now. So he figured to himself, Kai, this woman. So he decided to go. He decided to go with the woman. And he ate the fruit. He was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he took that fruit and ate it. He made a choice to go with the lie. And immediately they, they accepted that lie. Something happened. They lost that dominion. I'm going somewhere. They lost that dominion because they accepted the lie. Meaning, even the speech they had before, they lost it. So a lie about the character of God took away speed from them. Took away dominion from them. So, the loss of speed comes from what? Believing a lie. The loss of the ability to manifest stuff comes from what? Believing a lie. Meaning, if we are going to restore speed, we must get rid of the lies. Mm. Are you here? Yes. So, so if, if I am going to regain speed to manifest stuff, speed to, to bring forth the things that then there are lies that need to go. So what it means is this, please hear this, hear this. If I am struggling with manifesting things speedily, there are lies that are undermining me. Are you here? There are lies that are what? Undermining me deep in my subconscious mind. Those are the lies that are stopping things from coming through. So, so when God wants to grant you speed, He will have to help deal with the lies that you have accepted. And guess what? All of us have picked up lies. You see, that lie that Adam believed, it sank into his DNA. It sank into his DNA. His children were born with that lie to me and you. And we, we all have those lies. And we need to get rid of them. Amen. 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 So, so the first lie that went in there, it was that God is not good. Now I want to tell you something about these lies. It was that God was not good. And based on that, the woman ate, gave to her husband, she ate. They disobeyed God. But a lie was sown. But over the next few hours before the time when God was coming, that lie had grown inside of them. It went from God is not good to God is horrible to God is dangerous. How do I know that? When God showed up, when they heard his footsteps, they ran. When do you run from somebody? It's when you think they are dangerous. They want to hurt you. You run away. So can you see how that lie went from God is good, sorry, God is not good, to God is horrible, to God is dangerous. And that's the thing with lies. When we accept lies, knowingly or unknowingly, the lies get worse inside of us. So now, they are running away from a loving father who had nothing but good intentions for them. And guess what? When they ate that fruit, 
He think God did not know they ate it. God knew that he, they did. But this is the thing about the God we serve. He still came. He still came according to the program. I normally come at the cool of the day. He still came. He knew they were hiding. He still came. Hallelujah. Amen. What they have done, the lies they believed about him did not change his behavior towards them. He did not change his behavior towards them. He still came. He still showed up when he was supposed to show up. But the problem now is they could not receive him. They could not show up because they had believed a lie. That lie inside of them now has created an estrangement in the relationship. So God is looking at them lovingly as his children. They are looking at God fearfully as a dangerous being. So now we, they have they, they, they have fallen off from the same page with God. Two cannot work together except they agree. So they see God as a dangerous, lying person who doesn't have good intentions towards them. But that's a lie. Inside of God's heart, He loved them. He had plans for them. Remember that God's plan was for them to master Eden and then take Eden and spread all over the planet. Because Eden was supposed to spread all over the planet. Remember he said to them, replenish the earth. So he, they were supposed to, the model, Eden was supposed to be a model, like a pilot project, which they were supposed to take and spread Eden all over the earth. But that process had now been truncated. God looked at them, they are naked. They tried to solve the nakedness problem by sowing fig leaves. God saw that this is not going to work. Fig leaves, in a matter of hours, it will dry up. And they are going to be naked and they are going to be cold. In his love for them, he made a plan. He made a plan. Even though now they think he is wicked, they think he's dangerous, he didn't still stop him from loving them. What does that say to me and you? You know, we can, we can be naughty, we can run away from God, we can be stubborn, we can, but his love is unrelenting. Yes. His pursuit of God is unchanging. Yes. His commitment towards you. But let me tell you something. The devil will tell you that God is angry with you is a lie. Yes. God is never angry with you. Yes. He loves you so much that he still keeps chasing you yes. even when you are rebellious, even when you are stubborn, even when you, whatever, he is still chasing you. You know, one of the things that he would do sometimes is to let you be. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. You know, remember the prodigal son? The father? You know, when the boy left home, there's no way it's written in Luke chapter 15 that the father was chasing after him. No, he didn't. He let him be. But I believe he was still praying for him. How do I know? The Bible says when the boy was in his way back, he saw him from away off, from far away. And he ran towards his son. I know that boy was not running to come back home. Because he was guilty, he was, you know, filled with condemnation and so on. So I could imagine that he was just walking slowly, coming back home. But his father was right. running. So for every one step that boy took, his father took ten. Towards him. That's the God we serve. So I don't know who you are. You may be running away from God, but I'm saying to you, he's running towards you. You may, you may have done some horrible things that you are ashamed of, but he is chasing after you. He's coming. If, if only you will yield your heart to him today, he's coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So, my lost speed, the ability to control the process of manifestation, which is a part of dominion, he lost it. 
So man became grounded. Now things are taking long to manifest. In fact, when God was spelling out, you know, people erroneously say that God cursed man. He never did. He didn't. He was spelling out the consequences of their disobedience in Genesis chapter 3. One thing God said is that the land will no longer produce for you. It will now produce tons and tistles. And before, you used to think it, say it, and you have it with no sweat. But now, you have to sweat. Because sweating was not the original plan. Do you sweat to think? Do you sweat to speak? No, that's how it was supposed to be. You think it, you say it, you have it. Now, the land is not going to respond. God told them. The land will produce tons and tistles. Even now, you are going to be sweating to make the land produce. Meaning, you don't have speed anymore. You've lost the dominion. You are now grounded. And that was... But God said, I'm going to solve that problem. God said it. He said it to them right there that day. I'm going to solve that problem. And God made a plan to solve that problem. And what was that plan? He was going to come. He sent his son to come and pay the price. And help man. Because Jesus came for many things. He came for many things. One of the things that he came to do was to show man once again what God looks like. Remember that they believed a lie about the character of God. That was the fall. They a lie they believed about what? The goodness of God, the character of God. So from that time, from that time in the garden, man has never been able to know God for who he really is. For the first time, God is being shown for who he really is through the life and ministry of Jesus. That was why when they said to Jesus, show us the Father, he says, why are you talking like this? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I, Jesus is the express image of the Father, the Bible tells us. So, so before Jesus, nobody has truly seen what the father looks like. Pastor, are you saying Abraham did not see the father? Yes. Jesus said so. Are you saying David did not see what the father? Yes. Jesus said so. So Jesus was the first person since the fall. Adam saw what the father was like, yet he didn't know all of the father. Because if he knew all of the father, he would not have fallen for that lie. It was still unfolding, but the enemy truncated it. So now Jesus came to show us the Father. So when we want to know God, if we want to know what the Father looks like, or how the Father thinks, or how the Father will respond to any situation, look at Jesus. Hallelujah. So if you want to know how does the Father behave, or see a situation like this, check Jesus. How does Jesus behave in a situation like this? Look at the teachings of Jesus. Look at the life, life of Jesus. Look at the behavior of Jesus. That's the Father. So for the first time, humanity has a correct picture of the Father in Jesus. Now this is very important. What I just said right now is deep and very important. Many people are very confused because they, they look at Old Testament manifestations and they think that's how the Father is. No, no. The most accurate picture of the Father is Jesus. Any other thing before that time, they didn't really know. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. So, an example, for instance. I'm just throwing out an example. There was a time that in Jesus' ministry, some people were giving them a hard time. Samaritans, some Samaritans were giving them a hard time. His disciples were very angry. 
there were two brothers who were disciples. They were called the sons of thunder. I don't know whether it's because their father is thunder or they themselves, you know, just are very thunderous. But the Bible called them what? Sons of thunder. So that tells you how, how explosive those boys can be. They, these people were pushing them and their patience were running out. They said to Jesus, allow us to deal with these people. Jesus said, what do people want to do? He said, we will call down fire. The way Elijah called down fire, we will call down fire to burn these people. Jesus said, what? Jesus said, what are you people talking about? You don't know what manner of spirit that is in you. How can you say that? Jesus rebuked them for the thoughts of what? Calling down fire to destroy men. No, you didn't hear. <laughs> Jesus said, no. He rebuked them. Why? Because the Father does not do that. The Bible says he came to seek and save that which was lost, not to destroy men. So the Father does not have it in him. So, so when they said, let us call down fire like Elijah did. <laughs> but today we have people calling down fire to burn people. In the name of Jesus. Amen. No, don't say anything. <laughs> How are you calling fire in the name of Jesus to burn people? The same people that Jesus died for. He's already died for them all. He went to hell for them. He died so that they would not have to go to hell. And the Bible says he had given to us the ministry of what? Not the ministry of body. Not the ministry of combustion. The ministry of what? Reconciliation. That's the ministry we have received. Not the ministry of combustion. Our ministry is to reconcile men back to God. To tell them the Father loves them. To show them the character of the God in heaven. That they look at Jesus and accept the love of the Father. That's our ministry. Amen. Amen. I know there are wicked people. I know that there are wicked people and there are people doing wicked things. But can I tell you something? Wickedness did not start today. It was there even when Jesus was on the planet. It was wicked people that killed him. Hello? Yes. So, so when he was telling them not to, not to call down fire, it's not like he didn't know there were wicked people. But it's the wickedness of men that made Jesus to die. Hallelujah. Amen. So God's response to the wickedness of men is not to call down fire. Can I tell you something? The love of God is the most powerful force on the, on the universe. Not fire. The love of God. Hallelujah. So our job is to pray for them. Let me tell you something. This is, this is where people don't get it. See, God, his love separates the sinner from his sin. So God loves the sinner but hates his sin. So God is able to separate the sinner from his sin. God, God hates the sickness but loves the sick man. God hates the poverty, but loves the poor man. So, so scriptures has many, many verses where God says, look after the poor. But God does not tolerate the poverty. But the poor man, Jesus, God loves. But he hates the poverty. The sick man, God loves, but he hates the sickness. The sinner, God loves, but he hates the So, the ministry of Jesus and our ministry is to make that separation. God loves the wicked, but hates their wickedness. So our job is to make the separation. Help separate the wickedness 
from the men. Do you know that the people who killed Jesus were on the cross? What did he say? Father, forgive them. Forgive them. For what? They do not know this. What they are doing is wickedness. They don't understand what they are doing. So, forgive them because I know your hearts towards them. You love them, but you hate their wickedness. So, I am standing as an intercessor, even though I am a beneficiary of their wickedness. But I'm standing as an intercessor, pleading on their behalf that their wickedness do not destroy them. So, Lord, forgive them of their wickedness. Because they don't know what they are doing. So our job is to separate the wickedness of the people from their wickedness. So that the wicked can experience the love of God. Jesus died for the wicked. Hallelujah. So if once we understand that, we'll be able to pray and pray right. Our job is to separate the sickness from the sick man. Because the sickness has already been judged on the cross. He himself hung on the cross and he took the sickness. So that, that, that when we, 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 who he has given that ministry, we can stand and make a separation. Say to the sick man, be free. Be healed. So your sickness does not kill you. And we pull the sickness away from the sick man. At any point in time, God is always willing to heal the sick. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what the sickness is. At any point in time, God is willing to heal the sick. Even when people put sickness upon themselves. Are you still with me? So, so this is our ministry, and we must understand it. So when we are dealing with wickedness, the wickedness of men. May we make the separation. Judge the wickedness, but redeem the wicked. Did you hear what I'm saying? Judge the wickedness, but what? Redeem the wicked. Hallelujah. Alright, so, our master set an example for us by the life that he lived and showed us the life we are supposed to live. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. I said we are followers of who? Jesus Christ. So, so if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are supposed to do as he did. If your actions are not lining up with his teachings and his behavior, you are not following him. Yes. Somebody said a follower of Jesus. You are not a follower of Elijah, you are a follower of Jesus. <laughs> Somebody say I'm a follower of Jesus. So, so he is our example. We have to keep looking at him and, and follow him. I want to follow him. Amen. When, 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 when he asked me to follow him, he said, follow me and I will make you. Follow me and I will what? Make you. So, so the, the proof that you are following him is that there is a making going on in you. And that making, that making is for you to be like him. Oh, yes. yeah. So if you are not becoming like him, you are not exactly following him. Oh, you didn't get what I said. If you are not becoming like him, you are not exactly following him. He is kind and compassionate. Yeah. He's what? Kind. So are you becoming kind and compassionate or you become heartless and combustive? You know, I, I used to be very confused about this thing. How can the Bible tell us in Galatians chapter 5 about the fruit of the Spirit? And ask us to imbibe the fruit of the Spirit. And yet, we are doing the things we are doing that is contrary to the fruit of the Spirit. It used to confuse me. Again, I ask the question, the Bible said, and the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. 
long suffering, self control. Nine of them. How can God ask us to imbibe the fruit of the Spirit if He's not like that? Think about it. It is the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit is God. Spirit of Christ. Is the fruit of the Spirit. The spirit. So meaning that the fruit of the Spirit is how God is. Love, joy, peace, patience, yes. kindness. Did you see patience there? What God produces. Did you see patience there? Yes. Did you see patience? Yes. Then he went to long suffering. He's there. But Christians are very impatient. Yes. Very impatient. Yes. We're impatient with witches. <laughs> we're impatient with wicked people. <laughs> we're, uh, we're very impatient. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Patience is there. Then, then, then patience shifts gear to long suffering. God produces it. Then he has, then he has self control. Then there's meekness. Then there's gentleness. And I'm, I'm asking the question: Where did, where did gentleness go when we become all feisty and combative? Can you see that we are not exactly following? May the Lord help us to start following. Amen. Because when we follow, He makes us. Amen. He makes us to become like Him. All right. Now, now, now. Let's. So, so we're talking about this speed matter. So Jesus came, shared an example that we should follow in His steps. The Bible tells us that we should what? Follow in His steps. He steps to set captives free. He steps to preach the love of God. He said all the things that he did while he was on earth, he left an example for us to follow. And then, then he died. He died. And then he came back from the dead. And secured victory over death. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And did what? And secured victory over death. When he secured victory over death, he made an announcement in Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been what? No, let me explain that statement. All authority in heaven. Heaven speaks of the invisible realm. All authority in the invisible realm is given to me. Oh, Meaning yes. nobody moves in the invisible realm oh, so without my authorization. Oh, 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 oh. so, then all authority on earth has been given to me. Oh, 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 oh. Meaning nothing moves in the physical dimension without my approval. Oh, oh, oh. He said that. And he could only say that after he came back from the dead. Amen. We're talking about restoration of dominion to man and the ability to manifest speed. Everything you see in the natural came from the spirit realm. Can I get an amen? amen. The spirit realm is the mother of the natural realm. Yes. So the spirit realm gave back to the natural realm. So when we walk by faith, we are trying to pull realities in the realm of the spirit and manifest it in the natural. Are you here? That's what we are doing when we are we walk by faith to believe God for his promises. Because the promises of God are in the spirit. And we take what is in the spirit and we pull it out and manifest it here. Hallelujah. In 1998. While I was praying about a certain lady who has shown up in my radar, and I was asking God about this woman, and I was uh, quite intense in that season in prayer, I had a dream. And in that dream, a baby was given to me through this woman. I was a baby boy. And I received that baby boy. To 
through this woman. I couldn't see who gave her the baby, but I could see someone gave her the baby and then she handed the baby to me. And I woke up from that dream. And I said, what is the meaning of this dream? As I contemplated this dream, this was the same woman that I was praying about. And this son was given to me through her. I realized that God was confirming that this is the woman I'm supposed to marry. So I took what I received. I wrote it down in my notebook and I kept it while I continued praying. Over the next few months, I was convinced that this was the woman. So I called her and I shared with her what I had in my heart. And I asked her to marry me and she said yes. So we got married. Exactly two years after the day that I asked her to marry me, we got married. When we got married, we said that we were not going to have a baby for like the first year. We needed to settle down. So, it's not as if we would try to do anything to stop her from falling pregnant. But we, it was not our desire. So after one year, we are now ready to have a child. And child was not coming. So we got married in 2000. 2001, no baby. 2002, no baby. 2003, we are not getting worried. What is going on? But you know, in the midst of 2001, 2000, 2001, 2002, I remembered that dream. I remembered that dream because God speaks to me through dreams. It's not only way He speaks to me, but He speaks to me through dreams. Most of the major, major decisions I have made was revealed to me in dreams. So I knew there was a child somewhere in the spirit. But I needed to bring that child from the spirit realm to manifest. So I was not worried because I knew that there was a baby. Before I agreed to marry this woman, God had already shown me that she is the woman through whom God was going to bless me with children. So, here we are now, three years into the marriage and the baby was not coming. So what did I do? I stood my ground. And I, I prayed. I confessed the word of God. I reminded God of that promise that he made to me in a dream. 2004, I came to South Africa. There was still no baby. In 2004, somewhere in 2004, one night I was praying and I heard the voice of the Lord. He said, and his name shall be called Angel. I heard exactly what I just said. And his name shall be called Angel. So I heard that and I, I, I stood up from my place of prayer and I wrote it down. You see, at that time, my wife was very sensitive about this baby thing. So I didn't want to tell her what I had. Because every month, when she sees her period, it's crying. And she used to say, God, why? Because now there's pressure from home. Everybody's calling. And they are asking all kinds of questions. And in fact, we have to come to a point where we told the people at home, do not ask us that question again. <laughs> we will, we will, we will tell you when the baby is here. Mm. Leave us alone. Yeah. It was too much pressure. Every month, they will call. Hey, is the baby here now? Is there, is there something happened? Ah. And then when they make that call, my wife will start crying. So, when I heard that word, I did not tell her. I just wrote it down and left it because I knew it was a sensitive issue. And I don't want her to start crying again. So I left it. But I kept on praying. 
In 2006, the Lord answered us. Amen. And when she missed her period, we thought, okay, let's not start rejoicing. Let's wait. Two months. It's okay. Uh, this period, we're not seeing it. So we have a friend of ours who is a gynecologist. So I said, so we did the, we went, I went to the pharmacy, I bought the home pregnancy test. And we tested it and it was positive. I said, let's not announce it yet. <laughs> so when it was two months, we told the gynecologist, she said we should come for a scan. So we went to the hospital and he, she did the scan and I saw the baby. The baby was very small, but there was a heartbeat. So at this stage, you could not tell whether it was a boy or a girl, because it's eight weeks. When I saw, I said to her, it's a boy. She said, how do you know? I said, because God spoke to me seven years ago. Seven years ago, it's a boy. God, long story short. Nine months later, a boy came through. Amen. So that boy sat in the realm of the spirit. It took seven years to pull it, to manifest it. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to say something to somebody today. Whatever it is that God has promised you, whether it's marriage, whether it's ministry, whether it's money, I speak speed right now in the name of Jesus. I speak a manifestation in the name of Jesus. So that reality that was in the spirit became, I remember the day my, day my son was born. When they gave, pulled the baby out, the baby came by CS. And the, the, the obstetrician pulled the baby out and then handed over the baby to the pediatrician. And the pediatrician did what she, she needed to do and then handed the baby to me. And I carried that baby. I started crying in the theater because this baby was a prayer point on sheets of paper. You don't know how many sheets of paper I wrote the name of that child. Praying over that sheet of paper. And reality dawned on me. It's no longer a sheet of paper. It's a human being I'm carrying in my hand. I don't know who you are. But a dream. It's been on a sheet of paper. It's been a prayer point. You, you've carried it. You, you've made a dream board. I declare in the name of Jesus the season of manifestation has come. The that which is a prayer point has become reality in your hands. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want to zero in as I finish this message. God is in the business of taking things from the realm of the spirit. I believe by the leading of the spirit of God, the set man over this house received for us to talk about divine speed. And I came to talk about it because it doesn't have to take seven years. It doesn't have to take 14 years. It doesn't have to take 20 years. We have pulled that miracle and bring it through. We have pulled that manifestation and bring it through. Receive speed to manifest it. In the name of Jesus. Tell me the Bible 
close with me to Mark chapter 2. I want to show you something in Mark 2 as I round up this message. After this conference, testimonies. I say you will come to share your testimony. In the mighty name of Jesus, the grace of God is coming through. In the mighty name of Jesus. All right. In Mark chapter 2, I read from verse 1. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them. Not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic, a paralytic who was carried by four men. Somebody said four men. Four, four men. men. He was what? He was paralytic, meaning he was paralyzed, meaning he was not able to move, meaning he was grounded. So this guy had no potential for speed. He can't move. He's what? Grounded. Right. Four, bro four brothers brought him to this meeting where Jesus was preaching. And when, verse 4, and when they could not come near him, so what they wanted to do was to bring him so that he could see Jesus. And they believed that if we could bring him near him, the power of God can hit him and lift him from his the place where he's grounded. Are you here? Yes. All right. So they couldn't bring him in. Because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Wow. All right. Let me sit, 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 sit. Let me teach this. Sit, please. So this is a man who is grounded. So I want you to see him in the light of what we're talking about in this conference. This man had no speed. This man had what? He couldn't move. He had four friends. Four brothers who were determined to shift his condition. Jesus was in the neighborhood. And the Bible said that the power of God was present to heal. When we read the story, as Luke said it, the power of God was what? Present to heal. So, so news went into town that there's an anointing to break this thing over our friend, over our brother. His friends had become very frustrated that he couldn't move. His friends were no longer satisfied that he couldn't move. And they wanted to help him gain speed. They wanted to what? Help him gain speed. So they brought him on a bed and brought him to the conference where Jesus was preaching. But there was too much crowd. People everywhere. They tried to get through the door. They could not. They tried to get through the window. They could not. They said, what do we do? Somebody said, well, we have tried. It's not our fault. One of them said, never. We are not going, we can't give it like this. We will not, never, we are not going back. We can't, we are tired of having him be like this. So what do we do? We know 
that Jesus is in the house. If only we can bring him to have a direct access to Jesus. This situation will be turned around. So, they are thinking about what to have to do. Somebody said, we are going to climb. We are going to what? The other one says, are you, are you serious? We are going to climb. So all of them agreed. They said, but if we climb, when the owner of the house get angry? He said, we don't care. We will deal with it later. later. So if we climb, what, what, what are we? we they said, we will take out the roof. We will rip the roof. Somebody's house. We can be arrested. It's okay, we'll go to jail. We need this man to gain spirit. We can't allow him to be like this. This is the question that I brought today. What did that man do to have this kind of people around him? I want to ask you a question today. Who do you have around you? Who is willing? Who is willing to do whatever it takes to change your condition? Who do you have around you? Who is willing to go to jail rather than leave you to continue the way you are? Do you have people around you? Do you know who they are? Do you know who they are? Can I tell you something? I don't know what sin that man committed that brought this situation on him. Because Jesus, by his response, attributed his condition to something that he did. But whatever it is that this man did, but I want to tell you something about this man. This man was such a person that developed this kind of relationship where people were willing to bend over backwards to get him help. I can tell you now, this man must be somebody like that. You, you didn't hear what I said? He must be somebody who is willing to do it for other people. Otherwise, there is no way those people would have said, ah, ah, if we go to jail, we go to jail. If he is, if we were the one on the bed, he would do the same for us. Let's go up on the roof. Let's go up on the roof. I kept here to announce today that for you to get into where God wants you to be, you need to have some quality people who are willing to sacrifice, who are willing to go the extra mile, who are willing to do whatever is necessary. If we go to jail, we go to jail. If we incur a consequence, we incur a consequence. But we will not leave you to be like this. Because of the quality 
of the people around him. Could he, could he carry himself up on the roof? It doesn't matter how much he desired a miracle. Without those brothers around him, he would never get it. Somebody was willing to risk it all to bring him into the presence of Jesus. Somebody was willing to what? To risk whatever it took. Remember, when they opened the roof and they brought him down, the Bible said, and when Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? The faith of the man, not the faith of the sick man. The faith of the man. When Jesus saw their faith, Jesus spoke the word. And he says, your sins are forgiven you. Amen. I want to say tonight, God wants to raise you to be a person who can release their faith for people around you so that you can attract those kind of people in your life. Amen. And we are talking about gaining speed. We are talking about becoming on on stock where we are and moving forward, you need friends. You need faithful people. You need people who are willing to sacrifice. You need people who are willing to give whatever is necessary. But can I tell you something? You can't reap the harvest of a seed you have not sown. So in, in talking about gaining speed, you must become a person. You must become a person who is willing to sow himself for other people. You must become a person who is willing to show himself for the gospel. You must become a person who is willing to give all. I thank God for the friends of this brother. Because we can't be talking about him today without those four people. It was their faith that Jesus saw. How do you see faith? Jesus saw the actions they took. Jesus saw the determination. Jesus saw the risk they are willing to take. What of if they fell while climbing the roof? They said, we don't care. We will not fall. And they opened that roof and brought that man down. I finished this message tonight by looking at what Jesus said. Your sins. What is sin? Sin is to miss the mark. That's the definition of sin in the Bible. He has to speak. Sin is what? To miss the mark. To miss the mark. So this guy missed the mark somewhere. Every sin comes from a lie. Every sin comes from what? A lie. Yes. So the first sin that was committed by Adam and Eve came from a lie they believed. The same way every sin today comes from what? A lie. It's a lie you believe that makes you do what you do. So, yeah, when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you, meaning there was a lie that grounded this man, that made him paralyzed. There was a lie. His friends, these friends, understood that if we bring him into the presence of truth, Jesus is truth. If we bring him in contact with truth, we will set him free. So they did whatever is necessary to bring him in, in contact with truth. I'm going to pack it here. I'm going to continue tomorrow. The Lord wants to heal somebody today. The Lord wants to correct a, a lie, an error. An error you have believed that has granted you that is stopping sleep from manifesting in your life. And I'm going to stop here tonight. We want to correct that error. Stand to your feet. When Jesus spoke, he corrected that error. He said, your sins are forgiven you. And the man rose up. And speed came back to his life. I don't know what the error is. But the Spirit of God is wanting to correct errors tonight. I want you to lift your hands and let us talk to the truth himself. I want us to talk to the truth himself. I don't know where you are. I don't know what has grounded you and grounded some dreams. This 
evening, I want you to lift it up before God and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive the truth that sets me free. I receive the truth that releases me to move. I receive the truth that sets me free. In the mighty name of Jesus, I am on stock today. I am on stock today. I release myself from anything that has held me down. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. The revelation, the encounter that releases the truth that, that, that manifests the miracle. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, I encounter with truths that releases me. I encounter with truths in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, set us free, release us from our forward.
tonight. Amen. The entrance of your word is light. Amen. I pray that our hearts be illuminated Amen. by the entrance of this word. Amen. And as we go out from here in this might, yes. Lord, we ask that we begin to step into a new level yes. of revelation yes. and insight. Amen. And be surrounded by faithful and capable and honest friends. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for your servant you have used. Virtues have gone out. We release virtue on him. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We call forth new insight even tonight. Yes, As he meditates on this meeting, Lord, that you reveal to him what to say to us tomorrow. Thank you for this program. We are stepping to a new level. Amen. We move on a higher speed. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We thank you for every man of God that is here. Lord, we ask for the release of virtues on everyone. Amen. Bless their ministry, bless our soul. Thank you for the man of God, your son, the, the state man here. Lord, we ask that you prosper this ministry. Amen. Bless this work, O oh God. Amen. Bless everyone who is supporting this work. Be glorified tonight. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. On behalf of the church, we are so grateful to you, to every one of you, as we are ministering. My Lord was ministering, my friend came in, Brother Stephen, Osai, God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And my sister, Mrs. Sola, Judah, we welcome you. And every other person, please, men of God, I do not take it for granted. Second of this meeting. Wow. Please clap for the moment. You have encouraged me. Uh, God has given me men. God has given me men. Amen. I have attracted the best. Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. We are so grateful to you. Thank you so much. I promise you tomorrow we're going to close early. It's our tent that affected us today. And on Sunday it's going to be one o'clock. And uh, we're in touch with our father that by four o'clock we want people to leave the streets so that they can go home and rest thank you so much we appreciate you why thank you so much total restaurants we thank you we thank you our neighbors and everybody who has turned up today please if you don't have transport just be patient we make sure you get home we have transport to take you home and if there's anybody who is going along your area please help us to make sure that we do not leave anybody to walk home tonight. Amen. 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 The grace, Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the Holy Spirit be with us now forevermore. Amen. And surely His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We shall bring the God's presence. Forever and ever. Amen. I want you all. I shall not die, but live to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Thank you so much. I say you shall not die, but live to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. And we shall not die, but live to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. God bless you, Thank you so much for joining with us.